The internet likes unboxings. We can watch me unbox the Mac Studio. The cable is now braided. USB on one side. The lightning uh, connector for phones on the other side. I uh, feel like the Magic Trackpad should probably really go to USB-C. iPhone should maybe go to USB-C too, who knows? Holy shit, that's like very light. The box you're actually all here to watch me open the Mac Studio. Why did you want to watch me open the Mac Studio? Or why did I want to watch why did I want to show you the Mac Studio opening? Here's the deal. In our dream scenario, we get all the power we need out of a laptop, and we roll to sit with that laptop, and life is great. But I'll be honest, and I'll say that there's been many times in my life where I took a Mac Pro to sit, to do dailies, or downloads, or on-site compositing, or something. I even got really good. The old Mac Pro, there was like a way you could strap the seat belt into the back seat so it felt really secure. The reason why I was interested in showing the unboxing part in the review of this video is I have a suspicion that this is going to be the power man beast we take to set a lot. And when you're a bigger filmmaker, it'll be in a pelican case and it'll be all slick. But like when you're a little indie, you'll often just take it to set in the box it came in. So it's kind of curious. I don't know, think Apple was thinking that when they designed it, but like, it's got a nice little carry handle on top. And I kind of think that this box looks like it is relatively durable enough that you might be able to hang on to it and have it be your little run to set thing. I've even been in a position where a couple times like we've driven an iMac to set. It's never the goal. <laughs> Those are like complicated beasts. But you know, we're getting twice the power out of this than you get out of a Mac Pro. So the ability to then roll with that to set. is kind of slick. I see what you're doing, Apple. It's like a uh, pops up like that. Man, they're really going hard on the braiding. I like it. Braided cables are beautiful. So you got the braided cable. You got the box that sort of gently pops up. I feel like there's enough protection that this is probably a case I would keep in the closet of the production company where I store all the old hard drives, so that when I need to run this puppy to set, I can do it. Mac Studio. Human head for scale. So, bigger than a Mac Mini, not as big as a Mac Pro. Probably the sweet spot for filmmakers. Studio display. Same party, basically. I'm a big fan of a big monitor on set. This is a 27 inch. I like a 50 if I can do it. The nice thing about it is you get the same monitor on set that you know at home and that gives you some reliability. So let's fire it up. Now, for nerds, classic Apple startup sound, we all know it really well. Classic Apple startup sound just came out of this, not the display. I wonder if when I start it a second time and it knows the display is there, it's going to come out of the display. Because knowing Apple, the studio doesn't have an amazing speaker. The studio display does, and I have a sneaking suspicion we're going to see that the sound comes out of the monitor the second time I start it. Charles Hayne, standing here with the new Mac Studio. Uh, embargo lift is today, very excited about this system and happy to talk about it from a filmmaker's perspective because we just want to make movies and we want it to be as easy and seamless as possible to do that. And I was super excited about the Mac Studio and I'm excited to talk about all of the cool stuff it does. Quick overview of what you're looking at. M1 Studio, this is the Apple M1 Max, this is a $2,000 machine. I think it's really interesting that they sent the Maxes and not the Ultras to review. And here's why I think it's interesting. I think it's interesting because it's still super powerful as a Max. It still gives you a tremendous amount of performance. And I kind of think it's a sweet spot in terms of price point. I think that $2,000 price point is kind of killer. I know a lot of these decisions are like, we'll send out 10 of these and 100 of those and, and shake it all out. 
but I think it is like a smart move on their part that I think from the impression I'm getting there's a lot of maxes out in reviewers hands and it's a $2,000 machine and I think that's a really smart thing to have us reviewing if that makes sense because in my testing so far it has still been really impressively powerful at that $2,000 price point and I actually think it's going to be the big seller obviously for certain workflows you're going to need ultra if you are a filmmaker who's like I bought three Blackmagic 12Ks, and everything I do, I shoot three camera on the 12K, and I render it all out, and I make 8K masters for my 8K private home cinema. You're going to want to think about the Ultra. <laughs> you, you might even want to wait for whatever Apple Silicon Mac Pro comes. But for the vast majority of us that are like, oh, maybe I'm doing a 12K job, but I'm making 4K dailies, and, and then I'm taking that 12K job, and I'm making a 4K master, the M1 Max is actually really powerful, and it's a really nice sweet spot, sweet spot for the amount of power you get out of it. Um, so, Mac Studio, bigger than a Mac Mini. Mac Mini used to be about yay high to a grasshopper, and now the Mac Studio is tall. Um, we've got an SD card slot in the front, which I love. When we switch around here in a second, I'm going to plug this into my own personal workflow, and instead of seeing this nice pink backdrop, you're actually going to see what my office looks like, which is fun. And... Um, it, you know, you got, YouTube is about sharing who we really are, and you guys should all see that I have a messy office. The, I use the SD card slot in my little CalDigit uh, T4 breakout box all the time. It is like a super useful tool. It is funny to me that they went SD because Apple is famous for being like, we have the slots next. Like, we move on, we drop the old format, and we move to the new one faster than anybody else. And it feels like we're at the end of life of SD. But I think Apple is saying maybe we're not. Um, you know, it's like that old Royal Tenenbaum slide, like most people assume Custer died at Little Bighorn. What my book presupposes is maybe he didn't. Uh, I think Apple is saying, like, most people think SD is done, but what I'm saying is maybe it's not. Um, some people have moved on to see if Express Type B, you see that in stuff like the new Sony cameras. Um, but SD is still a big part of my life. I still use it all the time. So I like that they still gave us the old slot. And then we've got some Thunderbolt slots, and you can see on the back... Do I have enough cable slack that I'm just going to do this? I'm just going to do this while it's all plugged in. Don't do this while it's all plugged in. But you see on the back, we've got a full-size HDMI. We've got four Thunderbolts. We've got old USB. We've got a really sophisticated audio port. And we've got our power. And we've got 10 gig Ethernet. So I don't have anything to show off the 10 gig Ethernet with. But I really love that 10 gig is available for a very affordable option inside here. Because what a lot of people don't talk about is that a lot of little post houses we run... A little post house, you're going to either run sneaker net, which is literally people taking physical hard drives running it around. You see relative, like, sneaker net's a very common thing in the indie space. But beyond the sneaker net, um, we really like to run some sort of networked infrastructure. And you can do that with fiber, but fiber gets really pricey. And when you run into fiber, you want, like, a real technical person making it work. However, copper, which is what 10 gig is, is like a bone simple thing. Most people can figure out how to get it all set up. And you see a lot of little places that run like a copper network for file sh sharing. And so getting 10 gig speeds for like a little copper network f so that we can set up like a jellyfish in, an, in a closet and share our media that way is like super slick. Love it. Big fan. So I'm still not obsessed with the color of monitors, uh, computer monitors. We'll look at it a little bit when we swoop, swoop around. It's not my fixation because every piece of software shows video differently and so you end up in these situations where you have the same piece of video and like VLC player looks different than Resolve, looks different than Premiere, drives me nuts. I really only care about video quality in terms of like its output through something like a DNX, which we're going to flip around and we're going to see in a minute. All right, so I've just thrown a bunch of random things in the timeline. I'm just goofing. I go over to my color room and I'm going to go up to playback. I'm going to turn on render cache to smart. What that usually means is that usually means that Resolve is going to go through and it's going to start throwing some of these. It's going to say they're red. Um, and they're going to say it's red natively because the file is too big for the software to play natively. Resolve is always constantly evaluating what it can play in real time because Resolve wants to play in real time because that's a good client experience and colorist experience. And, you know, when I first ever shot this area raw, like test shot on the 14mm Sigma, it was like very, like machines weren't happy playing the Airy Raw if you didn't have a super beefed up machine. A 2000 machine was certainly not going to do it. And now it can just play it and get it right up there. There's a little bit of color on it. Looks not great um, because of that. But Bam. Right away, right up to 2398. No struggles. Now, and it doesn't turn red. 
It has no issue. It can handle it. It's like, I got this. So what we're going to do next is we're going to drop on a little noise correction and it should immediately turn red because, you know, bam, immediately turn red. But I'm just going to sit here for a minute. We're going to let it process. There we go. So it turned red and now it has turned blue and now we're looking at a node playing 2398 with noise correction on it of 4K area raw. Obviously once that's baked in you can then do nodes later in the pipeline, any changes you make to the noise correction are going to recorrect, but, you know, for five frames of temporal noise correction, that is pretty, pretty, pretty good. You're getting sort of a nice, healthy dose of power. You get these nice playback speeds, but I still recommend people do a 720p ProRes proxy workflow. I still like, or ProRes LT. I still like that. You can send people dailies over Dropbox. It's more fluid, you're working on a big dock with 20 hours of footage, I still like it, I'm old. I realize other people just wanna shoot something and bring it in their timeline, and good for you, but like, I shoot something, I run my dailies overnight, I edit it the next day, it's all great. Um, so all of this full res playback is gonna be wonderful when you're doing your final conform and when you're doing your final color grade. But when you are popping out dailies, that's when I think the power becomes a really interesting sort of setup. So I've got this 12K shot, got a 4K airy raw shot, a browse them. I'm going to put them up on the dailies. I'm going to make ProRes Master individual clips. Uh, I'm going to crank them down to like 720 LT. Add to render queue, render all. And you know, out of my 12K ProRes file, my 12K, out of my 12K Blackmagic file, I'm getting a 25, 26 frames per second render. I'm getting better than real-time render speeds. So if you're old enough, like some of us, to remember when I was like shooting 4K files and to make my transcode, I was sitting there waiting at like four frames a second unless you had a red rocket and you had to pie a red rocket for 5,000 to get real-time red transcodes, seeing something like a 4K area raw file, which is always a slow transcode, and we're up here at like 45, 46 frames a second on those transcodes. If you're out shooting red raw on Alexa, which like very few people do, but if you did, you're getting twice real-time transcodes. If you're out there shooting Blackmagic RAW, you're getting real-time transcodes. So you're getting all this power, which is sort of insane for a $4,000 machine. It's especially insane for a $2,000 machine. Next up, we're gonna throw this guy on my desk, so you're gonna see my messy desk. And on that messy desk, we're gonna attach it to my DNxIO, and we're gonna talk about image. Here's the thing I wanted to show. I love that Apple is focused on color management in these monitors. I'm not faulting Apple for pushing color management on these monitors. They should have nice color. But, small HD OLED, the nicest of the seven inch monitors. I get out a Klein K10 probe regularly and I probe it with that to check its accuracy. d -E under two, looks like this. And even running Resolve, my footage looks like this. And like, this is totally normal. This is completely part of the fact that one of these monitors is running the image through a software processor that's previewing what it looks like. And then the other, oh, and the other which only shows, because that's a 1080 monitor, so it's showing a crop in, and this is set to 1080 right now. So let me go and change my timeline to 1080. Now we're seeing the image. They don't look the same. And this is like, this is a firmly established part of workflow. So if I do have a niggle with Apple, Apple puts a lot of marketing into how color accurate these displays are. And I believe them. I believe that they are way more color accurate than they used to be. The problem is still when I'm looking at software versus when I'm looking at an actual video image. And what I'm worried about is I'm worried about people mistaking the two and thinking, oh, I can color grade on this. And what this looks like, that will look like. Because here's the thing, that little image, and I could probably make it bigger. There you go, my full screen image. That image is designed, the whole point of a broadcast image is in theory, that is gonna look identical at the facility. I'm delivering to Netflix, I'm delivering to NBC. Their broadcast monitors should look the same as mine. And, now, and this never works because the monitor's small versus the monitor big. It should look the same in a theater. So my worry about all the marketing about the color accuracy of the monitor is that people are going to think, oh, I can just use the Resolve preview monitor. 
and be completely happy and assume that it's, this is going to look the same if I'm lucky enough to get to a festival. And that's the one niggle I have about this whole situation. It is legit a beautiful monitor. And I have a sneaking suspicion it's going to become sort of because of its price point and the way Apple markets, I'm suspecting a lot of my clients are going to be looking at the final results of what they do on this monitor. And based on that, they're going to be wanting my grade to look right on this monitor, which I'm cool with. I am used to that. We live in this universe where that is part of the deal. And I've fully come to accept that that's part of where we are. But I just always like to remind people that like a, a calibrated broadcast monitor being fed an actual video signal is always going to be more reliable in terms of the whole chain than color grading off the desktop. That being said, like if I pop this over to my random, um, I mean, this looks even further, right? And this is just some random HP. I have no idea what HP it is. I literally bought it by price. I guarantee you I paid less for the HP than I did for the small HD OLED because I just got a random monitor for my desktop. I wasn't even thinking because I never worry about color accuracy with my desktop. I always want to make sure I'm finding some way to look at an actual color accurate representation of the image. And I guarantee if I opened up the same video file in Avid or in Premiere, they're going to look different in the in-screen viewer, but they're going to look the same on my reference calibrated output. And that's the dream. So I'm not, I'm not even really going to dig into the color on the monitor. I don't really have a problem with Apple focusing on the marketing of the color monitor, but for filmmakers specifically, I don't think it's a place where we should put a lot of our attention because ideally we want to be finding ways. And this whole setup is getting easier and easier. I mean, there's a $150 little Blackmagic mini monitor that you can hook up to Thunderbolt 4. And then there are color accurate monitors under $1,000 now. When I just started out, that would have been a dream. Um, and hopefully you can find a way to get some time on one or rent one um, when you're doing your final color grade instead of relying entirely on these things. However, all that being said, I do like, the image does look quite nice. Um, I was, uh, I always had Apple Studio displays forever and ever and ever. In the old style, I never got the $6,000 display, but you know, I, I do like the image. I think it is a pleasing image. I'm not objecting to the image. I'm just saying it's not gonna ideally match. You can even see there's a little bit of a different color cast and that's just part of the universe of working on computer monitors running software versus broadcast monitors running video. Now, that said, could I do a situation where I did like 80% of my grade here and then I do the final day with a broadcast monitor? Maybe. If there was a commercial that, let's say, I graded in a color suite with a client, and then three weeks later they wanted to make one little tweak, could I make that one little tweak, judging on here? Absolutely. Those kind of things, it is very normal. And knowing that my client is going to be watching their final results on this monitor in some sort of preview display, um, I feel like it's going to become kind of a default. Actually, I'm going to use this guy as a test guy because I know the audio really well. So. That's the more exciting thing for me. In terms of getting your picture work approved, I think we've all gotten used to the idea that picture is sort of a mess and, you know, like hopefully they're watching an iPad Pro and Frame.io or they're watching something else really controlled and we've learned workarounds for that. Audio is still this nightmare scenario where people are either using like some random red earbuds that they got as a Christmas gift, or they're using their computer desktop speakers and they're unpredictable, or like you have to invest in something like an audio output and the studio monitors, which again, mine aren't even that great. The idea that this has really nice sound building the monitor, and frankly, I think it sounds quite nice. Um, having like been in the room when we mixed this, I feel like it's a really nice representation of what the mix was intended to be. But like, oh my God, the idea of all of my clients having a monitor with like really nice speakers built in as the default. That's cool. That's like exciting. So like, I hope these propagate for that reason. Also, what a nice simple stand. So that is my first thoughts. I've only had a couple days to play with it. If I have, I'm gonna keep playing with it for a couple weeks and hopefully I won't have any new horrible thoughts. But if I have new horrible thoughts that come to me, I will feel free to share them in the future. But that's like some stuff about the studio display. Behind me, without autofocus.
the new Mac Studio. So, those are my thoughts on the new Mac Studio. In every review you do, you want to say the good stuff and the frustrating stuff. I don't have a long frustrating list, and I haven't with Apple lately. Um, I know that there continue to be people out there that are like, well, you could put together a PC for like 30% less or whatever, but like, can you at this point really say that you're going to get that level of performance? Like, to build a $2,000 PC that does what this thing does... I think would be really difficult between the tight integration with software like Resolve and Final Cut Pro and the Adobe apps, between all of the power they're getting, between just the responsiveness you get because they merge the GPU and the CPU so it can use all the memory together. It's it's sort of a dynamite monster. A, a big criticism you will sometimes hear is people are like, well, but I'm pissed because I bought a Mac Pro and that came out two and a half years ago and this is sort of replacing it. And look, I have empathy. It's always frustrating when a new thing comes out. But two and a half years is a long time. Two and a half years is sort of a normal tech release cycle. Uh, and let's be fair, when the 2019 MacBook, Mac Pro came out for six grand, A, we all had a lot of fun making fun of how expensive that monitor and stand were. But B, we knew Apple Silicon was coming. We, uh, we didn't know it was called Apple Silicon yet. It was just Apple was moving to ARM and we knew that was going to happen. And so you invested in that as like, oh, this is my last Intel machine. A $6,000 machine is a professional tool. Hobbyists are not buying a $6,000 machine. I actually wonder if it was deliberate that Apple didn't do anything affordable at that level. That there was no $2,000 version of that Mac Pro. It was like $6,000 or nothing. You were either a pro and you need the pro power and you'll get two years out of that pro power. And in two years, you should justify the cost of a machine. Most pros are thinking about a two or three year life cycle when they invest in a piece of heavy equipment. You're not buying a camera expecting you're get getting 10 years out of it. You're not buying a computer expecting you're getting 10 years out of it. And so I feel like two and a half years later to come out with something like this is fair. Um, especially because this still doesn't have PCI slots. So if you bought that 2019 Mac Pro for the PCI slots because you still have a workflow where you need those big PCI slots, well, you got two and a half years out of it and you're going to get at least another six or eight months out of it until we have a Apple Silicon um, system. And once PCI rolls out, we don't know how Apple Silicon is going to handle PCI. So it could be another six months before your PCI workflow works on those new systems. So I think it's an okay amount of time. Um, I really love the price point. You know, I work in education. Like, I can totally see outfitting a bunch of suites or a whole lab with these in a way that, like, educational facilities can't afford, but that are giving real power to student filmmakers to actually start doing some sophisticated stuff. Um, the horsepower in this is really impressive. I'm psyched about sort of... The simplicity of the offering. There's like not a lot of boxes to check. You know, I pretty regularly get emails from people being like, which one to buy? And I'm like, well, it's pretty simple with this one. Like you either have $2,000 or you have $4,000. Um, and frankly, the $2,000 one is super powerful. And you'll be able to do a, a whole lot of stuff in 8K on the $2,000 model. I mean, one big thing to remember is that obviously when you see those demos from Apple where they're showing eight streams of 8K or 16 streams of 8K, that's always in progress. Raw performance is never going to match that. Um, but hell, take your raw files and transcode them to ProRes. And away you go. Apple ProRes raw might match that, but your Blackmagic raw, your Red raw in 8K, or your Canon raw in 8K are not necessarily going to match. You're not going to get eight streams going. But so? So you don't have eight streams of 8K. Like, two streams of 8K, three streams of 8K is still incredibly powerful off of your raw playback. So, yeah, I mean, I don't have frustrations. I'm mostly like, this thing is great. Um, I really like, as we did in part of the test, but like, you know, I've already got my whole system built where it's all just plugged in with one um, Thunderbolt cable to my MacBook Pro. And I love the fact that I can just like take my MacBook Pro out and put this in. And then all of the accessories that I use just work off that one Thunderbolt cable and have enough power to do it. And I don't know, guys, it's pretty great. Yeah, all right, Charles Hain, Mac Studio, Studio Display.